Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. Today, we've got Keith Black. He has 30 years of financial market experience, serving approximately half that time as an academic and half as a trader and consultant to institutional investors. He currently serves as a Managing Director of Content Strategy for Kaya, which is the Chartered Alternative Investment Analyst Association. During his most recent role at Enos uh, Nup and Associates, uh, Keith advised foundations, endowments, and pension funds on their asset allocation and management selection strategies in hedge funds, commodities, and managed futures. Dr. Black earned a BA from Whittier College, an MBA from Carnegie Mellon University, and a PhD from the Illinois Institute of Technology. He's earned the Chartered Financial Analyst, or CFA, designation and was a member of the inaugural class of both Kaya and FDP members. Keith, thanks for being on the podcast. Uh, thanks, Josh. Thanks for having me. Uh, and so I work on um, on writing the the textbooks for for Kaya. I work on on grading the exams for Kaya. I'm uh, I'm co-author and you know one of the voiceover artists for the the fundamentals program, uh, and then uh, one of the the first members of the the FDP uh, Institute as as well. So the markets have been doing some crazy things, some unprecedented. Um you know, events like talking about negative interest rates potentially after uh, the uh, the Fed's reduced rates to zero and then talking about potentially hitting negative interest rates for, for oil, um, kind of uh, unprecedented. Have we seen anything else like that in the markets right now? Uh, so Europe has had negative interest rates for, uh, for over a year. There's $15 trillion of uh, negative yielding uh, paper uh, in in the world, it started with the uh, the sovereigns in uh, in Europe, uh, and now that's spread to even um, non investment grade or junk bond companies in in Europe. Some of them have uh, have negative yields, and so what we see is that that the dollar uh, continues to be a, a very strong currency. And so when we know that um, the dollar is a is a strong currency, the dollar has positive interest rates, and you have negative interest rates in Europe. That could bring a lot of capital into the the U.S. coming for those uh, those positive interest rates. And so, if you're a a, a German-based investor, uh, you you have negative uh, interest rates on on German boons. You come over to the U.S. You buy um, you buy Treasuries at at one or two percent yields, uh, and you have a positive return on the dollar. Uh, there's a, a significant uh, positive return uh, for you. Uh, as as that uh, investor, and so what we'll see is that as the dollar continues to be strong or even stable, uh, if interest rates in the U.S. are higher than than those abroad, uh, we'll we'll continue to have uh, uh, capital flowing uh, into into the U.S. Uh, it's a very interesting time, as you said, for the the commodity markets. Uh, we're going back many years of um, of oil prices, and so we're making. Uh, almost 10 year lows uh, in in oil prices in the in the last few weeks uh, but you've heard that the the US government wants to to refill the strategic petroleum reserve uh, so and uh, the the state of Texas is encouraging uh, producers to to shut in supply so uh, we could see a, a near-term floor here uh, in the in the oil price uh, but that assumes that uh, we get back to some level of normal economic activity in in the U.S. So so hopefully uh, these uh, these lockdowns last uh, maybe one to three months. Uh, we get on the on the backside of the disease as uh, as China has has already done. China is already ramping up their their production. Uh, so they got hit in in December and January, and now at the end of March they're they're starting to uh, to come out of their their lockdown. Uh, so if we can uh, do that in in June or July, and and get back to normal, uh, then maybe there's some some upside to to oil. But we need the the trucks to run, the cars to go, uh, and certainly the the airplanes to fly to to see some upside in the uh, in the oil sector. So there's nothing normal about this. I think the last time that uh, that Texas decided to reduce output, I wasn't even born. I think it was 1976. And then you know you look at um, at the dollar, which is increasing in value, or another way to say that is, is every other foreign currency is decreasing in value as they chase um, 
position, they want to close out their positions. My understanding is that some of these dollar denominated loans need to close out. In order to do that, you have to borrow US dollars, which is creating an artificial shortage or, or yeah, basically a short of, of dollars. And that's driving up the, the US dollar decreasing. Like I think we saw Australia decreasing 8% in one day uh, on their currency. Have we seen anything like this where there's been a dollar shortage as people race to, to close out dollar denominated loans? Well, we, we call this a flight to quality. And there's a, there's a perception that, that the dollar and US treasuries are, are going to be strong uh, in the face of a, of a crisis. So part of this is, um, is panic buying uh, simply because people wanna be in, in what they perceive to be a, uh, a relatively safe asset. Uh, and so if that, uh, if that continues, the, the dollar and the, and the treasury market uh, will, will continue to be relatively strong. Uh, if, if you wanna go back, uh, I, I think it's uh, 1998 uh, and 1994, uh, there's some, some interesting history from, from Asia. You could look at uh, a currency crisis in, uh, in Thailand, uh, Malaysia, yeah. uh, and, the, and the Philippines, where they had um, fixed rate currencies uh, relative to the, to the dollar. Uh, and, and so the, um, the corporations uh, in Southeast Asia were, were borrowing in, in dollars, but they had um, revenues in, in Malaysian ringgits and, and Thai baht. Uh, and so what, what happened was the, the local government uh, couldn't support that that fixed rate currency anymore. So the uh, the the government was buying the uh, the local currency and and selling dollars. Uh, and the the point came where the the governments ran out of money uh, to support that trade, and we saw uh, a downside in those in those currencies in in just a few weeks of thirty to sixty percent as they broke off that that fixed rate. And so what what happens now is those those companies. Uh, that either had to source goods abroad or, as you said, had dollar-denominated debt. Now their liabilities are, you know, 30 to 50 percent higher than they were uh, just just a few weeks ago. Uh, and and so if you have dollar-denominated liabilities, uh, you don't want to have all of your revenue in a in a local currency and all of your your liabilities in in the dollar. Uh, initially, you thought that. Um, it was cheaper to borrow in the U.S. or there was more money available in dollars than in your local currency, but you have to, to hedge uh, what we call a, an asset liability mismatch. Speaking of hedge, where, where do you see the alternative investments right now? It seems like a systemic risk. Margin calls are liquidating pretty much everything in a portfolio. It doesn't seem like anything is sacred and that everything is plummeting. Um, is there an alternative to invest in and in the meantime when margin calls are still being met? Uh, so on the on the publicly traded side, there there is a lot of downside risk. You see um, uh, U.S. stocks down 20 to 30 percent. Uh, the real estate sector and, and REITs are down 40 percent. Uh, and we're starting to see um, downside in both investment grade and in, in high yield debt. There's some places you could buy supposedly investment grade U.S. debt yielding over 7% today. Wow. Uh, and, and so there's an assumption that a lot of that, that debt that's currently rated investment grade isn't going to uh, have, a, have a good credit experience going forward. Uh, I was going to ask you to explain the, the significance of that because with some of the REITs or the real estate investment trusts, if they get downgraded, won't that, be a, a, won't that affect a lot more companies because if you're a pension plan you have to have a certain you know whether it's triple a or otherwise you have requirements in there and if you're downgraded then they're forced to sell and that sort of exacerbates the, the situation some of the multi-state operators in the hemp and cannabis industry being like MedMen, one of the most popular um will they be affected if if prices of commercial real estate drop just a you know like a percentage or two you're saying some of these stocks are down 40 percent but as a whole if the industry sees a correction there should be i mean new york is already seeing some some vacancies like they've never seen before so where where is the 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 risk with with the the commercial real estate and and uh in the market right now uh so so i'm working from home right now and our <laughs> uh, our full company is 
Uh, and so the, the concern is, what if people like working from home? Mm. Uh, mm. What if the, the company actually perceives that productivity is, is equal or even greater working from home than working in the, in the office? Mm. Uh, if, if that's the case, uh, even if we're, we're locked in just for, for you know, a few weeks, uh, that might change the, the long-term behavior of companies that people like working uh, virtually. Uh, we're, we're also worried about uh, stores and, and restaurants. If we're, if we're out for just one or two months, could we lose uh, you know, a substantial portion of the, the stores and the restaurants, right? They need to, to pay their, their rent uh, in addition to their, uh, their salaries when they have uh, little to no uh, revenue. Uh, certainly, you know the cannabis space uh, a lot better than, than I do, uh, but maybe that's a, a, um, a flight to quality where, where people who are able to, to pay their rent and work at home need a little uh, anxiety reduction, and maybe that's, um, that's something that, um, that is going to, uh, to remain strong, uh, but we saw probably an 80% downside risk in the, in the publicly traded cannabis space in uh, in just the last few weeks, even though we're bouncing off those those lows, the the last couple of days, and so for um, for commercial real estate, whether it's um, it's multifamily, whether it's office, whether it's it's retail industrial, uh, it all comes down to are are people paying their their rent, uh, and there's a there's a knock on effect here, right? So not only does the restaurant or the store go out of business and not pay the rent there, the the people who used to work there. Have to pay the the rent on their on their apartment building, uh, and and so that's a that's another area of that uh, that commercial real estate where we might be seeing some downside risk. I think after two thousand nine, you know, when we hit the the lows on March 9th of, of two thousand nine, a lot of those people who lost their jobs in construction or or wherever it was at found occupations in. Uh, as as waiters and waitresses, and so as everyone is being forced to shut down, that's going to what maybe shift them to the grocery stores in the meantime to collect a paycheck. But it's going to have a dramatic effect on the industry as a whole. There were people who left Microsoft to to start food trucks, you know, and and that's really just kind of expanded the amount of restaurants. And in my opinion, I'm not a foodie, but I go to a lot of places and I'm just not satisfied with the. The, the value that I'm getting. So the food isn't as good as what I'm supposed to be paying. You go to a nice Thai restaurant or Indian restaurant, you're, you're supposed to pay $100 for me and my wife, and that's not even including alcohol. So um, whether that forced consolidation or capitulation occurs, those people are going to have to find another job. Is there any idea of, of where they may land? Is there, is there any data to support uh, some, some theses on, on where the new occupation will flow? Uh, right now, Amazon is hiring. Uh, and so you've got unprecedented demand in supermarkets as well as any kind of, of delivery, right? And so whether, whether you work for uh, you know, UPS or FedEx or, or Amazon, Amazon's looking to, to hire 100,000 people to, uh, to deliver packages. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of them uh, are, are on furlough from uh, hotels or restaurants or, or retail operations mm -hmm. that are now furloughed. Mm -hmm. This seems like it's, it's more of a symptom where the problem, in my opinion, or from my experience, seems like it could be a Forex play. And I'm wondering about your opinion on, on my hypothesis here, where China was devaluing their currency. And that forced a lot of Chinese to take that money and bring it to Vancouver, San Francisco, Seattle, Toronto, and they put it in piggy banks in the form of housing. So in the spring and summer of 2016, half of all Seattle suburbs were uh, having real estate being purchased with cash, which is pretty unheard of, you know, 60 plus percent. And so that flight to safety, as you mentioned, in, in my opinion, or my view, seemed to be more of a Forex play to get the money out of China so that it, the prices wouldn't be depressed. And now that we're kind of seeing close to support levels or the bottoming out eventually, do you think that, or do you see the housing being sold as a result and then housing prices also taking, taking a fall similar to 2008? So there's, there's two things that, that drive the, the housing market. Uh, one is the, the local job market and, and two are these, these international uh, money flows. Uh, and, and so at the, at the end of the day, 
uh, you have to look at uh, at Hong Kong and uh, and San Francisco as as generally unaffordable uh, to people unless they have these these great jobs in in tech or in real estate or in uh, in financial markets. Um, but I'm I'm really worried about this um, you know working at at home trend, right? Why why should someone be in a in a crowded expensive city like uh, like San Francisco? Uh, when they can move elsewhere, and we're seeing tremendous job growth in uh, in Austin and Nashville and and Columbus and and some of these other places where you could buy a house for less than a quarter of the price uh, that you can in in Northern California. And so if this if this work at home trend uh, really uh, really accelerates, uh, it's going to be hard to support the the prices in um, in in some of these cities. Kind of want to get into uh, the market a little bit with some. Uh, investment opportunities. The the cannabis and hemp space, as you mentioned earlier, has taken a, a beating just about the same as, as every other sector. I think Hilton was down 33% uh, on Tuesday or Wednesday this week, um, w- which is really hard to lose a 30-year market cap in a single day. <clears throat> and the cannabis industry has been no, no different. So today is an up day. I think that's a dead cap bounce. I think we're still going to see some margin calls. But Overall, the industry has taken such a beating that I think eventually we're going to see the bottom. Um, you know, Hexo has a 42% increase today, but you know, what is that with a 22 cent gain? That's really nothing. But machine learning and everything else is going to, to I think, have an impact. We have an AI-based cannabis index, and so our competitors, being MJ and Podex, are down 64 and 67 percent since August 1st, whereas our AI-based algorithm that has technical analysis with predictive analytics is up 37%. I'm working with a portfolio manager who's also a Kaya member, uh, Rohit Shavastav. He's with uh, Saroj and Banu Fund. I met him at the Seattle chapter of the Chartered Alternative Investment Analysts Group, uh, where I was a panelist for alternative investing. This is back in, in August. And so by comparison, you know, year to date, you know, almost 4% doesn't sound that good when, uh, until you look at the competitors that are down almost 45 and almost 60%. Um, where is the, the future with alternative or with, uh, with AI and machine learning? Given what we've seen uh, in, in alternative data, uh, people are building long, short equity, equity hedge funds. And I assume the, the reason that, that your fund had positive returns is either you took short positions or you got completely out of the market when you saw a, uh, a downside signal. Uh, and, and so what we're looking for uh, in, uh, in hedge funds is uh, generally a, a hedge fund can be both long and short stocks. Uh, so a mutual fund is generally 85 to 100% long. We gave you the money to invest and, and you're investing it for, for better or, or worse. But when you're in a, in a hedge fund, you could be 100% long, 100% short. And a lot of these um, equity long short funds uh, are on average 50% net long. So the, the, the long-term position might be 100% long and 50% short. Ideally, you've got good stock picking on both sides, and you're going to take half the risk uh, relative to the to the market. So hedge funds that are that are doing their job uh, shouldn't have a a 30% drawdown in in this market because they should have had some kind of uh, of short positions. Uh, what we see is that managed futures or trend following funds uh, actually have positive returns uh, in March and year to date. Because what trend following funds or you know black box um, managed futures funds are trying to do is, as you said, the technical analysis. And so basically what most of the funds are doing now is they would be long the dollar against some, some basket of foreign currencies. They'd probably be long treasuries uh, and they would be short, uh, short commodities and short uh, equities at this point. And so uh, in, in March, we're actually seeing positive returns from a lot of those those trend followers and, and managed futures funds. So is that the same as Momo or Momentum stocks? Uh, so uh, Momentum uh, is part of managed futures. And so in, in managed futures and trend following, basically if there's an upside trend, you wanna be long. And if there's a downside trend, you wanna be short. And so you're using uh, technical analysis uh, to, to determine where those, where those trends are. And so right now, 
uh, obviously you'd, you'd um, probably be uh, short all of the, the risk assets and long the, the flight to quality assets like treasuries in the dollar. How do you guys use VIX? I remember in 2008, fourth quarter, and then first quarter 2009, looking at Hartford Investment Group, HIG specifically, they were predictable looking day to day. Uh, you know, if, if there was a dead cap bounce, you could short it and almost guarantee that that's the direction it was going to go. And then the next day, uh, you know, you could, you could close that position and then go long uh, on the trade. Um, are you using volatility as an instrument to, to gauge, you know, the, the next day's response? Uh, so uh, what VIX is, is a measure of the, the price of, of options uh, traded on the S&P 500. So we're looking at uh, every put and call option in the, in the front two futures months to come up with a, a price of volatility. And over the, the long term, uh, VIX uh, trades at about 20%, which is our long-term uh, estimate of, uh, of equity volatility. But, but recently, VIX has been trading from, um, from 60 to, uh, to 80%. Uh, and so when we look at, uh, at assets that are, that are likely to have positive returns in a down market, uh, over the long run, we see that, that managed futures and macro hedge funds do have those positive return and down markets. Uh, anything that, that has uh, investment grade debt or, or treasuries probably has uh, a positive return. And then uh, if, you're, if you're careful uh, with, uh, with equity derivatives or, or VIX or tail hedge funds, uh, those could also have uh, positive returns. And so if you had the, the uh, foresight to, to buy put options on the S&P 500 or any equity index, uh, or if you have long positions in, in VIX, uh, those are both uh, very positive this, this month. But the, the problem is the, the long-term return to, uh, to VIX funds is, is actually negative uh, be, because um, it does have this ability to make money in down markets. Everybody likes to own VIX. And so uh, it's going to have a, a cost of carry. And so it could cost you uh, 2 to 4% per month uh, to be long VIX uh, in a market that's, that's, relatively, that's relatively quiet. And so even though you made you know, five to, to 10 times your money on, on VIX products in, in March, if you hold them till, till the end of the year, uh, you could actually lose money on that because uh, people pay to be uh, in VIX. Mm -hmm. What does your crystal ball say about uh, finding the bottom? I'm looking at Tesla right now because uh, I've bet somebody in California an ounce of California's finest <laughs> that that uh, Tesla will hit two dollars. Now I made that bet when they were at nine hundred, so literally at the peak uh, is you know around the, you know Valentine's Day is when I made this bet. Do you think that we're going to see Tesla hit two hundred dollars? And and what's your crystal ball say about the the uh, market overall? Well, uh, we're really worried about, uh, you know, car sales, right? And so in, in China, uh, car sales were down probably 80% in the first quarter. And I think the, the Chinese factory of Tesla was, was closed uh, for, for a while in the first quarter. Uh, and now, uh, I guess, in, in California, uh, California is on, on lockdown and the Tesla factory is not an essential business. Uh, and, and so we really worry about, uh, about people's uh, cash flow uh, and whether they're able to build cars and whether they're able to, to buy cars. And so it depends on, on how long we're all locked in and you know, what our ability is to, to buy a car uh, after that. I think uh, the, the good news for Tesla is that when it was eight to $900, uh, they, I think they were able to accomplish a secondary offering. Uh, so they, they got a lot of cash from, from selling stock. Uh, toward those those highs, which uh, which shores up their up their balance sheet, and so the the key to something like Tesla is to follow the bonds. Uh, mm -hmm. So you need to look at uh, how much money Tesla has borrowed, what the what the maturity structure of that is, and what the and what the yields are. And so uh, the the question is uh, is ca is Tesla worth? Uh, I see on your screen there eighty four billion dollars of of equity market cap, uh, or are the are the bonds non-investment grade and trading below par, and, and so in in some of these situations, uh, the the bond market 
is um, is the the smart money. Uh, and so if uh, if they can't pay their their debt, then um, it's it's hard to to justify uh, an an eighty billion dollar market cap. Mm -hmm. When I made the bet, I thought that Boeing would be the catalyst. This is before uh, Corona became a full on pandemic. I knew that, um, you know, the 737 max was, I think, one fifth of the GDP for, for the US. And looking back at 2008, we saw airlines and, and automotive industry just completely get annihilated. And with all of the, the uh, underlying distributors and manufacturers, I just assume that that would be kind of the catalyst to, to pop this bubble that we've had for a while from real estate to, to commodities. Um, and so with Boeing recently asking for a, a bailout, <clears throat> I find it fascinating that, that all of these companies from banks to airlines, everyone was buying stock back at the highest um, most expensive market we've had ever. And then now they're, they're not, doing stock buybacks wouldn't now be the most opportune time for stock buybacks why were they buying it then and why aren't they buying it now yeah so i guess the the airline industry spent over 90 percent of their cumulative cash flow buying back stock hmm. uh and and so right now is the is the time to have cash right and and uh it doesn't matter what you did with your with your cash in the in the past you want to have uh cash now uh, and so to the extent that you, um, you bought back stock in the, in the past, uh, you probably paid, uh, paid way too much for that, that stock. Uh, politically, the, the buybacks are, um, are now linked to the, to the bailouts. Uh, and so I would, I would anticipate any bailout, whether it's from the, uh, the airlines or, um, or, or Boeing or, or automakers, I think any, any uh, bailout is either going to have the the government, um, you know, buying stock at, at current levels, uh, or uh, prohibiting buybacks in the in the future. But the the government actually made money on the bailouts in in 2008, which is uh, really interesting. A lot of people don't don't realize this, that uh, whether it was uh, TARP or TALF, uh, when they when they bailed out the the large banks, when they they bailed out some uh, some insurance companies. Uh, now, uh, and Fannie and Freddie, uh, the, the government actually made money on those because we didn't just give them money, we actually made investments in their, uh, in their companies. Uh, and when they recovered, those investments became uh, more lucrative for the, for the government. And so the, uh, the net cost of these, these bailouts uh, in, in 2008 uh, was, was actually a, a net positive investment uh, on, on these cases. And so uh, if the if the government has strings on these rather than than giveaways, if they're actually um, I investments, uh, we would um, you know potentially profit in the in the long run uh, once we once we get back to a, a somewhat normal and, and mobile life. You know that that adds fire to the conspiracy of Reagan's uh, working group. They call that the Plunge Protection Team, and and that's the conspiracy that at twelve forty five, the last fifteen minutes of trading, the Plunge Protection Team steps in and, and buys up all of the stock to make it uh, rounded, like right at zero, so that there is no loss. Uh, but out in the out in the open, they've they've uh, been discussing buying equities in exchange. Um, for the troubled asset relief program. So instead of just giving companies bailout money, they're, they're buying their stock as a form of, of support or, or relief. Uh, and then, like you said, they made money in 2008, not really something that they normally do. Like AIG, they kind of just let them fail. Boeing, they may end up doing the same thing because there's a lot of public uh, pushback. What's that going to do to pension plans though? Uh, so, so right now, if you were invested in both, um, in both stocks and in in bonds this year, uh, you are at a at a loss for for this year, and so uh, on the on the equity side, uh, we're trading back at uh, 2017 uh, levels, and so if you just uh, own the the same basket of stocks you owned in in 2017, you're down on on that, uh, but there's a, a nice gain in the in the bond market uh, that that somewhat that somewhat offsets that. Uh, and so there, there are, um, you know, probably losses uh, in the pension asset portfolio, but we also have to look at the pension liability portfolio. And so we're looking at uh, the, the number of pensioners and what their wages are, 
uh, relative to interest rates. And so here, zero interest rates are a huge negative for the, uh, the pension community because we're discounting those, those future liabilities at a lower and lower interest rate. And so as interest rates go lower and lower, the, the liabilities of the, uh, of the pension plan increase. Uh, but we also need to, to anticipate how many pensioners we have uh, and how long they're, they're going to live. Uh, and so at this point, we need to anticipate uh, mortality experience uh, for those, those pension plans. The longer people live, the, the greater the pension liability and the shorter people live, the, the lower the potential uh, pension liability. So there's actually three pieces. Uh, it's the asset portfolio, it's the, the number of pensioners and how long they take benefits, as well as the interest rate experience. So there's a lot of moving parts. And how does the market, including pensions, get affected if negative rates go into effect? Uh, so a lot of pensions have an assumed return of 7%. And so when we put uh, stocks together with bonds, together with alternative investments, we need to have a 7% long-term return. So we've got the, the employees making a contribution, we've got the employer making a contribution, a 7% return. And if we have all the contributions and a 7% long-term return, we're able to pay benefits. If that long-term return from our portfolio does not reach that 7% level, either the, the taxpayers, the employers, the employees have to put in, in more money to offset that lack of investment gains, or in the long run, uh, people are going to take lower benefits from those those pensions. So if we hit negative 14% GDP, you're telling me that Illinois is pretty well screwed. Uh, I moved out. I moved out of uh, Illinois about uh, about 10 years ago, uh, and we're seeing a um, a, a big uh, outflow from these high tax states. Whether it's uh, New York, Connecticut, uh, Illinois, you're having a lot of people uh, leave that state because of the the tax burden and the fiscal situation. I actually know people whose job is to, to recruit hedge fund managers to move from New York and Connecticut down to Florida. And it's a pretty, pretty easy sell mm. uh, right about now, uh, both tax-wise and, and weather-wise. Yeah, that's not going to help the, the state and government employees that have pension plans, though. So regardless of where you're moving to, if those individuals are, are ex expecting uh, a pension payment, uh, sounds like they're going to have their, their, um, it sounds like those payments are going to be cut significantly. Well, you've got, you've got corporate pensions and you've got uh, public pensions. Uh, and so, so corporate pensions are going to need to um, uh, be backed by the, by the company. And so if the company doesn't get their, their 7% return, uh, then either the, the company has to put in more money or cut their benefits. And so in the, in the private sector, we've seen a, a huge move from defined benefit to defined contribution. Mm -hmm. So now the company's not taking the investment risk, they're putting that, uh, that investment risk onto their, uh, their employees. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the, so now the largest employers of, uh, of defined benefit plans are now uh, state government workers. So the, the police, the fire, the, the teachers are the ones who still have these um, defined benefit pensions. And again, if they don't get that that seven percent return, either we have to to raise taxes to pay it, or or eventually pay less in in benefits. Well, before we wrap this one up, I want to talk about the upcoming exam for the CFA or the Chartered Financial Analyst uh, designation. They hold those every June and October, I believe, um, and it's one of the most difficult designations to get. I think it has a, maybe a twenty percent success rate. Uh, and so is that still going to happen? Because I know that you have them in a room. How are you going to do uh, this, this exam, given that you're supposed to have social distancing? Right. So I, I'm a, a CFA charter holder, but I work for, for Kaya, right? So I don't, mm -hmm. don't speak on behalf of, of CFA. Mm -hmm. uh, CFA has had um, all three levels of exams in June, historically, and, uh, and then uh, level one was also offered in, mm -hmm. uh, in December. Uh, and historically, these have been all live exams. And so I took my, uh, my CFA level three exam in McCormick Place in, in Chicago with, you know, probably 2,000 other people in the, in the same room. Uh, you know, and you could put those desks, you know, six, six feet apart. 
Um, and, and so CFA uh, announced this week that, uh, that they're moving their, uh, their June exam into December for, for all three levels. And, and so uh, that gives people uh, an extra six months to, uh, to study. And given that it's, that it's March now, um, people weren't fully uh, completed with their, with their study program for the, the June exam yet. Uh, and, and as I said earlier, hopefully this is all, uh, all behind us in, uh, in May or June, uh, and we could come out of, uh, of hiding and, and reduce that mortality. Um, and so hopefully by, uh, by December, uh, life will get back to, uh, to normal. But uh, CFA does have difficult exams, uh, maybe a 40% pass rate at, at each level. And, and as you said, less than a quarter of the people make it through all three levels. Yeah, that's pretty wild. And so are you expecting a, a decrease for Kaya or the Charter Alternative Investment Analyst Association? Are you expecting those numbers to kind of decrease as people take a step back and, and try to figure out what's going on with, with the world? Or is it just business as usual? Uh, so we see that uh, to, to some extent, education is counter cyclical. So mm. when, when people don't have a job or when people are worried about their job, they, they actually want to have more uh, credentials. Uh, if people aren't traveling, if people are locked in, they actually have more time to, to study. Uh, and, and so uh, in, in March, we were hoping for, for one of our largest classes uh, ever. Uh, and, and some of that will be deferred into our uh, September window. Mm. Yeah, it's not easy. A friend of mine was sitting for the, the CFA level one and the guy next to him uh, was crying. Just a, a full grown man just sitting there sobbing that the exam was too hard. So I don't know if he didn't study hard enough, but maybe this is a blessing in disguise where people have more time working from home. And they're looking at a career change or other opportunities. They might be looking at, at Kaya as one of those uh, tools to, to help them either keep a job or, or uh, get promoted or, or otherwise. Right. So at, at Kaya, we have a, a level one and a level two exam, uh, normally in, in March and September, but we haven't been able to test as many as we'd like uh, in, this, in this March window. Uh, we have about 200 hours of, of study per level with about a 60% pass rate. Hmm. And uh, CFA is about 300 hours of study per level with about a 40% pass rate on, on each exam. So uh, it's about half of the, the time commitment for uh for kai as you'd see with cfa yeah that sounds almost reasonable <laughs> i know that the cfa was literally you kind of just had to say nope this exam is the equivalent of having a baby that you're just dedicated focus and you have to literally ditch everything and everyone for 90 to 120 days and just uh isolate yourself uh prior to self-isolation um but yeah, I really, I enjoy that uh, the, the FDP, um, CFA, CIA, uh, Kaya, all of those seem like uh, amazing opportunities and maybe people will start to take a look at that now that they've got some more time working from home. So what we found is that, that people are graduating from, uh, from university, even uh, an MBA in finance or a master's in finance, and they go to work for a pension fund and they say, what classes did you have in hedge funds or private equity, and they say, my university doesn't even offer those courses. And so uh, since 2003, uh, universities have, have largely been uh, behind the curve. Uh, and so people are coming out of, of even uh, an MBA or a master's in finance without the skills to go to work for uh, a pension fund, a sovereign wealth fund, or a university endowment that has large investments uh, in these areas. Uh, we also have a 20-hour uh, a video-based course called The Fundamentals of Alternative Investments. This is a, a quick online program, open book, meant for 100% pass rate to get people up to speed. Uh, so we're seeing, um, you know, uh, college seniors. Uh, they have a finance uh, major, but they don't have uh, dedicated courses in their, in their program and alternatives. Uh, they would take this before they would go out on the, on the job market to have a, a good sense of, uh, of what's going on in the, the world of alternative investments. So we started the Kaya program in 2003, 11,000 people finished that. The fundamentals program started in 2014, 6,000 people have finished that. Uh, and just last year, we started uh, FDP Institute, uh, Financial Data Professional. And so this is a, a, a one exam program uh, focused on the uses of, uh, of data 
in the financial market. So we look at, uh, at big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, robo-advisors, alternative data, uh, and then we require some, some coursework in, uh, in R or Python uh, to go with that. And so what we see is that, that hedge funds are starting to use what we call alternative data. So traditional data is everything coming out of the stock market. So uh, an income statement, a balance sheet, you know, price and volume from the stocks. Uh, but alternative data is kind of interesting. And so hedge funds are reading your email. Uh, hedge funds are looking at your credit cards. And so if we look at everyone's email and everyone's credit cards, we could try to find a, uh, a revenue forecast for uh, a mail order company or for Amazon. And when uh, the companies report their earnings, you said, oh, I already knew that, right? Because I read enough of your, of your email and your receipts uh, to, to figure out what your, what your revenue is. Uh, you could look at, at satellites or drones. Uh, so satellites and drones can tell you, uh, you know, how much oil is in a, in a storage facility, uh, how, how, um, how heavy a ship is, uh, you know, how many people are parked in front of what stores in the mall. Uh, and so those are all kind of, kind of big data, uh, alternative data uh, sources. And then you've got uh, social media. So some, some hedge funds are reading everyone's tweet on Twitter, if you can imagine that. Uh, so we're downloading everything on Twitter, and we're we're sorting it by stocks, and so we could we could try to figure out what the sentiment is on uh, on Tesla today, uh, and so we we read every tweet on Tesla. We use natural language processing, uh, and we figure out whether people are talking you know positive or negative about Tesla today, or we could even look at um, at cell phone signals and geolocation data, so we could figure out how many cell phones are turned on in the Tesla plant uh, to, to see you know, how they're ramping up production and how many people are working in the, in the factory. Uh, and, and so that's our, our newest uh, designation. Uh, it's a really exciting area that uh, the people are getting up to speed on. That's pretty interesting. So <clears throat> basically we used to say bad data in, bad data out. And so you've basically created a financial data professional to give uh, a designation to somebody uh, trying to aggregate all of that data and make sense of it. Um, it's interesting using AI and all of that technology and social media, people with their apps are giving you all kinds of access. Um, but what we found at least in, in the hemp and cannabis industry is that you can take and aggregate information, um, but with, without a professional to, to utilize a spreadsheet and, and make it useful, um, people aren't really able to do a whole lot with it unless you have a professional um, and so what, what are some of the results you're seeing as a result of launching this new designation? Um, are you coming up with, with new reports, um, new access, or what are some of the success that you've seen as a result of this financial data professional? Uh, so the, the first people who are taking this, uh, you know, are financial professionals. Maybe they, they have the, the CFA charter, uh, FRM or CAIA. Uh, and so they're, um, they're equity analysts, or or maybe they're they're interviewing managers who are uh, who are employing these these tools. Uh, and I took the the program my, myself in the in the first class. And what was interesting to me is the programming is not the hard part. That you know people have built these amazing libraries in in R and Python. Uh, that that it's relatively straightforward to to program these. Uh, but as you said, it's the it's the data that's the challenge, right? And so, uh, you know, what data do I want to use? Uh, what what story do I want the data to tell me? And what business problem am I trying to solve? And so, it's it's not the programming that's the that's the barrier. It's an understanding of of what goes into the program and an understanding of what comes out of the program and how am I going to use that in my um, in my business solutions. If people are interested, Keith, how can they uh, get a hold of you if they've got some in information or questions? Uh, and how can they take a look more about Kaya and what they have to offer? Uh, so our website is, is caia.org or uh, fdpinstitute.org. Uh, you could, uh, you could contact me through, through there or on, uh, on LinkedIn. And uh, questions could go to candidate at kaya.org uh, and they'll help you sign up for the exams. 
And all of those links will be in the show notes. So with that, we're going to roll this one up. I want to thank my guest, Keith Black. He's a PhD. He's a CFA, Kaya member, and FDP member. Uh, Keith, thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks, Josh. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Or don't.